Lord be with you. And also with you. Awesome. How's everybody this morning? Awesome. I like that. Who said awesome? Awesome. You're, you're, that gets the A. Joy. You didn't say awesome. I don't know. Um, I have a couple of announcements, and they're all related really to Holy Week. On uh, Thursday, April the 6th, we'll have a 6.30 p.m. service. It will be Holy Communion. Uh, it will be also a service of Tenebrae, which is typically the Good Friday service, but we're going to have them both on Thursday. And so Good Friday will be Good Friday because we'll be off. On Easter weekend, we'll have a service here on Saturday night at 5.30 and then Sunday morning at 11. If you're going to be gone with grandkids or wherever, you might be gone on Easter Sunday, feel free to join us Saturday night. It will be an Easter service, just like Sunday will. It'll be, the music will be different, but it'll be the same general idea. Um, a quick report on Joe. He's uh, been moved to an intensive rehab in Lake City. I can get the address or we'll have it if anybody's interested or down that way to go by and see him. I uh, don't think I've got anything else. Yes. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, we are we have a lot more shoes show up today. And uh, so next week is the last week that we will collect shoes. And these are going to CPS kids that are living in the CPS system. And we, you know, you've heard the story before, but we found out that these kids frequently don't have shoes or don't have good shoes. And so we are collecting either used, gently used, or <coughs> any shoes is better than none if you have none. And, uh, and so we're collecting shoes and they come in all sizes and shapes. We also found out that when they move from one foster family to the next, they frequently move with a trash bag. So uh, we've collected some backpacks and tote bags or whatever you have that you might want to bring. We can add those to it as well. And belts are good because we understand that that's an issue that they frequently have. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's all the announcements I have. So this is a, a sort of a new thing. I guess it's becoming a tradition. I'm not sure how long you have to do it to make it a tradition. Well, we're going to sing together, surely the presence of the Lord. <coughs> Take it a start. that are watching us on Facebook. We are doing Facebook Live nowadays, and we are welcome you here. This is Hope Community, United Methodist Church, Pasadena, Texas. We're about a block and a half east of Preston Street and about the same distance uh, north of Spencer Highway, if you're looking for where we are. We would love to have you join us uh, for worship anytime. And that's, as I said right now, it's 5.30 on Saturdays and 11 on Sunday. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we begin our worship service today, singing together.
Prince, you may be seated. I got those in the wrong order, Johnny. <coughs> Just the scriptures next, didn't it? I hope. Oh, uh, oh no, then just, uh, just put it on a black screen or leave it right there, that's fine, and I'll read the scripture. We don't have to have it. On. This morning's scripture comes from the prophet Ezekiel. I think it's one of the neatest stories in all of the Bible, but sometimes we need to think of it as not just a historical event that happened in a desert somewhere in the Holy Land, but how it might be where we're living right now. Hear the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. They were very, very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I'm the Lord. So I prophesied as I've been commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise a rat, and the bones came together bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds of breath, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded to me, and breath came into them, and they lived. And stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I'll bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I'm the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, would you stand this morning as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed? What is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. minutes I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward to the collection of our gifts, ties, and offerings. I was in an interesting conversation with a friend of mine that's a Baptist pastor on uh, Thursday night, and we were talking about creeds. Uh, you know, he was talking because they don't, he said, we wouldn't disagree with anything that's in the creed, we just don't say it. He said, except 
He said, I know better, but he said, the people in the congregation always wonder why we worship the Holy Catholic Church, and they think it's the big C Roman Catholic Church. This is my educational moment. It simply means universal. And so it means that all of us together, all Christians together. But when I was doing evangelism in the old days when I worked, when I was the evangelism chair at Deer Park Methodist, that's exactly what people would say time and time again. Why do you do that Catholic Church thing? So uh, that's why we do it. And uh, we are not a creedal church. I don't know if y'all know that. We are required to do a creed. Uh, that's why some weeks, last week we had the Nicene Creed. This week we had the Apostles' Creed. Uh, next week it might be the modern affirmation that we, we are not a creedal church. But I don't think it hurts any of us to remember once in a while that we believe Jesus really lived. They really died. He was really persecuted and murdered. And then he rose again. And so, uh, you know, that's the reason I always put them in there. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. While they're coming, I'll tell you that there still are. If there's no envelopes, we can make one for you. But we're still doing lilies. If you want to dedicate or honor somebody with a lily for Easter. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we know we're blessed. We live in the greatest country in the world. We live in a great place. Most days, we don't worry about what we're going to eat or where. You have truly blessed us. But we also know that there are plenty of dry bones in our community. And you call us to prophesy to them. And sometimes we do that with our words. And sometimes we do it with services that we provide for the church that require money. So today, we accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings. We offer them to you to be used in this community for the glorification of God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you with open hands and willing feet and hopefully an open heart. But God, sometimes we don't have the confidence that we should to look out into the world and think about what the world needs, what Jesus wants for this world, and not what is best for us. Every day we think about the things we can do for you, but we try to approach them from a worldly standpoint. How many people are in church? How many parking spaces we have? How many seats there are? And some days, how big the offering is. And yet you call us, much like you called Ezekiel, to be in the Spirit and walk out into a world and see what breaks your heart. But God, it's hard. It's not just hard, it's incredibly difficult for us to have the eyes of Jesus as we look into the community. Eyes that don't judge. Eyes that forgive. Eyes that see beyond what's in front of us to what you see. So frankly, God, we don't know how to get there sometimes. It feels like we are just trying over and over and again to no avail. But we know that what we sing about, there's but one train on this track. That's your way, God, not ours. Forgive us for the days when we become so self-centered. When we become so interested in what's going to benefit us and not thinking about what's going to benefit the kingdom. Help us to shore up our beliefs so that we believe that you will transform the world and we can be a part of that transformation. We think about Jesus' path as he walked nearer to Jerusalem. He didn't give up on you. And at the end, he knew you hadn't given up on him. So it's with humility as being selected, adopted, if you will, into the children of God, to the kingdom, the assurance of life ever after with you, that we pray the prayer that he taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> AJ is going to lead us in a, a really kind of a, a neat spiritual song, I guess. It's Christ beside me. Let's sing together.
friends, as you're able, would you stand out of respect for the reading of the Gospel? The Gospel of John, chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after her hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are you there? Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring to merely sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, it's some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then again, Jesus was greatly disturbed. He came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So she took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. 
Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. <coughs> so my message today is entitled, Lazarus is dead, or is he? And it matches up to me perfectly with the dry bone story, which says that the Spirit came to Ezekiel and spiritually, at least the way I read it, took him into this valley full of dry bones, which was related to the situation Israel is in, or was in, and I'm thinking it relates perfectly to us, to us today to the situation we're in now. How many times have we gathered around a table somewhere here in the church and said, we just don't know what's going to happen to the world because people don't seem to take church as a priority anymore? And not just church. I mean, really, you don't get saved in church. God does the saving. They don't seem to take God as a priority. They don't seem to understand that this is God's kingdom. This is God's plan. <laughs> and the fact is, they don't even know they don't know. <coughs> so my question to us, church, is do we have the confidence? Do we believe, like Mary and Martha, do we believe that Jesus can turn around what seems to be a dying, dry bones situation. And if we believe it, are we willing to tell the story even when it seems like it's fallen on dry bones? Ezekiel couldn't make sinews appear on the bones. He couldn't make the bones come back together. All he could do was prophesy what God told him to say. And what has God told us to do? Love one another. Are we doing it? Well, we might be in this room, maybe, some of the time. Some of the time we fall short, don't we? I do. So when you get to this story about Lazarus, it tells us a couple of things about God, I think. Maybe more than that. The worldly way of seeing what went on was that Lazarus was sick and dying. And the godly answer to that was, it's my kingdom, I'll get there when I get there. God's time isn't the same as ours. We want what we want when we want it. And God wants what God wants and will ultimately get all that God wants, but He wants us to help Him. There are no other hands and feet of God than ours. Now I'm speaking of just this church. Christians, people, followers of the way. Now, I think that translates into a whole lot of stuff we need to be doing. I mean, everything. I heard somebody on the radio talking the other day about, you know, we need a, they, they, their assumption was that we needed a third political party. Well, I mean, I'm 71 years old. I know how that works. You elect an independent, and the whole Congress will turn against them. <laughs> That's not going to work. So how do we do it? Well, Wesley knew that too back when he was in England, you know, many years ago. He knew that you can't do top-down change. You have to do systemic, grassroots, grassroots change. When we, the people, start to put people with more beliefs like ours, not on the right or the left, but people that are interested in the betterment of our community, whether it's our school board or our city council or the county commissioner, whatever level it is, when we start at that level, then we train up leaders to become the kind of leaders that we want there to be. But you can't do it in one election. You can't do it in one city council meeting. You can't do it in one church administrative council meeting. Probably the, the, the phrase that preachers like to hear least often from the church. There's a couple of them. We tried that before. How many times did Jesus try? How many times did God try? Did he give up just because it didn't work the first time? Or the other one is we've never done it that way before. Now why do you think they killed Jesus? Because they had never done it that way before. He knew the rules. But if a guy needed healing, he healed him on the Sabbath. He didn't worry about it. 
He knew what the Jewish worlds were. Trust me, he knew them very well. <laughs> Those rules were so strong that on the Sabbath, you couldn't untie a donkey if it would take two hands to untie the knot. That was considered work. We can become so bound up in thinking the way we think and not having a community think about what's better for the community, not necessarily for me. Everything has a worldly ramification, but everything has a spiritual ramification too. There was a book written once called The City of God. And in that book, the notion was that the city or the world we live in is here. We can all see it. And there's a superimposed God city put over the top of that. The solution to eternal problems doesn't come from worldly thinking. Eternal problems are solved by spiritual thinking. It's what Ezekiel had to see. It's what Jesus could see. And he was an opportunist. He said, you know, if we go back over there and Martha and Mary bring a bunch of their buddies down to the grave, this is going to make more difference for God than it would have been for me to hurry back and to keep him from dying. People are going to see. And he did it so that people could see, so that they could believe. So sometimes I get pretty personal about reading these things and I'm thinking, well, what have I done lately that somebody could see the glory of God through in my life? What about my life glorifies God? About my behavior, my actions, the way I talk, the way I spend money. Am I glorifying God so that other people can see? Because if I'm not, I'm not prophesying to the dry bones. I'm not getting the crowd around so they can see the miracles of God. It's one of the reasons that I have so openly talked about my situation with prostate cancer. My dad died from it. Apparently my grandfather died from it. And we think probably his dad died from it. It's been inherited in our family. It's the fifth largest cause of cancer in men. And the second, no, it's the second largest cause of cancer in men, the fifth largest killer of men. We don't talk about it much. We got lots of pink ribbons for women. God bless them for getting treatment and all the stuff that goes on there, but we haven't talked much about prostate cancer. The good news for me is tomorrow I get to go lay on a table and they're going to map me out for radiation with some high-tech stuff that only God could have thought of because it doesn't, you wouldn't even believe it. How can I make the situations, the suffering, the pain, the troubles of my life somehow glorify God? Because I think that's the ultimate goal of being a child of God. Not to just simply go home and say, I saved myself or I got saved or God did it, but to tell people about it, not in a... In a, in a, a, a braggadocious way. I've seen so many miracles. I've seen so many miracles come out of this church. I don't think I would have got to see them in a bigger church because there's so many people. Not that we're a small church. I had the first sermon I ever preached in this building. We had stained glass window then and I went over there and looked out the windows because what I was hearing about this church, Golden Acres Methodist, the previous church, we're a really good family-like small church. Well, if we're part of God's church, if we're part of the church of Jesus Christ, there ain't nothing small about it, friends. Amen. Nothing. It goes from now to forever. We have a chance to be a part of eternity with the people we meet. The first year we opened this Hope Community United Methodist Church, we had 35 adults made a profession of faith. We haven't had that many a year since. We were new. 35 adults. What does God say when one, when one is found? There's a celebration in heaven. Can you imagine the party if there's 35? Or what if we take all the churches together and all the people that have came to faith? Let's get over the Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian thing. If you're saved, you're saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
What does it say in that Ezekiel passage? When they were brought back to life, there was a great multitude. We have a great multitude. The question is, have we paid attention to the four winds of heaven blowing breath back into us? Or have we given up? As a kid, I used to tell my dad a lot. He'd give me some job to do. I'd get flustered and say, I can't do it. I've heard that from our discussions in men's Bible study and other places. We just can't do it. You know what my dad said? He said, can't never did anything. Can, will, effort, spirit, belief. Belief that our God is such a God that it would be God's desire that every single human being on this planet would get on that train we sang about a while ago. Just one train going to heaven. Now the question is, what's our role in that? You know, I don't think the, the old ways we thought of knocking on doors and asking people, are you saved? I don't think that's the solution. We're not looking for an overnight emotional transmission of, or, or a profession of faith. We're looking for a transformational profession of faith where people's lives are changed from who they were yesterday to something different today and something God wants to happen tomorrow. So Lent, these times before Easter are the times set aside for us to think about where we are on the train. Are we opening the doors, inviting other people onto the ride, or are we just enjoying the scenery? <coughs> are we buying tickets and handing them out so that other people can experience the joy of the greatest ride on the, in eternity? Garth Brooks sings a song about it. I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> well, you already know I can't sing, but those of you on Facebook may not know I can't. Yeah, no singing. But uh, he talks about being an observer, you know, standing on the side of the river and watching it go by. I'm sure we've all stood by a river or a creek or around here a bio, a bio, <laughs> whatever I can say that. What he says is you've got to get out in the mainstream where the captain is controlling the stream and we get to go on the ride and see the glory of God. Now I've got to tell you, if you haven't seen it, you're not going to be able to tell somebody about it. So Lent is a time to reflect on the glory of God in your life. Sometimes our transformation is so gradual that we don't really notice it ourselves. I remember about, oh gosh, it's been 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I guess. Uh, some people over on St. Augustine Street in Deer Park had a uh, coffee house. And uh, I stopped by there one day to meet them. And they were uh, extremely uh, energetic about their Christianity, which I'm okay with. And we talked for about five minutes, and I got ready to leave. And they said, oh, can we pray for you? I'm not used to that, friends. Uh, you know, people I don't know, just out of the blue. The guy treated my house at their park the other day for termites. We got ready to leave. He said, how are you? I told him a little bit about my story. He's out there in the front yard, his hands on me, you know, telling me, telling God and everybody that the, the cancer's gone. It was a little different. So anyway, they invited me to preach there on a Saturday night where they had people sitting around the curbs outside. They had somebody playing a guitar and stuff. And they put up on the marquee, Reverend Jack Womack will be here preaching Saturday night. And I'm amazed that there weren't wrecks on St. Augustine Street where some of my high school buddies said, who? That's not the guy we went to high school with. No, I'm not. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And neither are you. Amen. Amen. And sometimes I don't think we build ourselves up enough. Because we are ministers of the gospel, all of us. And sometimes we do it with words. 
And sometimes we do it by putting food in the food pantry box or bringing shoes. Those are kind of worldly ways of doing it. And sometimes we try to lift up the checker at H-E-B or Kroger if you still get to have one. Sometimes we see somebody with maybe looking not so cheerful and we offer them a smile. And sometimes we, like Jesus, look beyond what we see and understand that people, no matter who they are, have pain in their life. We've had pain. We know what it's like to lose loved ones and have suffering, but because we believe what we believe, those memorial services and funeral services, they don't have to be so sad because we know that healing has taken place. Amen. And we don't know what it looks like. <clears throat> We've created all kinds of worldly images about what heaven looks like. We don't know what heaven looks like, but we do know there won't be any suffering. There won't be any hungry kids. There won't be any poverty. We know that. Amen. How do we know it? Because Jesus told us. And he said, you know, friends, I have a place for you. Depending on which version you read, sometimes it's a mansion, sometimes a room, sometimes it's a house. Does anybody really care if they get to go? Nope. We're going to have different cares. Maybe our true spiritual self, the one we want to be so much now, will actually be present there where we look out at the world with love. But let's don't wait till we die. We don't have to wait till we die to start loving, to start caring, to pay attention. And I think when you look around, what you're going to see is some of the world we think of as not caring, not aware, not interested. Some of it, those people have been hurt so bad they don't know where to go. And the last place they think they're going to be accepted is in a church. St. John's United Methodist downtown is right under the edge of the Pierce Elevator. Rudy Rasmus has done a wonderful job there at 8,000 members, I think they have. It's a really, really diverse group. Might be a lawyer sitting next to a homeless guy. They don't worry about it. They just worship God. They go out into the kingdom. They're building apartments for lower, in, low, lower income people. They're doing stuff that makes a difference. Now, every church can't do everything every other church does. The Salvation Army, you all know it's, do you know, or you may not know, it's actually a denomination, came out of the Methodist Church. They do a lot of ministry we can't do. They do meals on wheels, a lot of stuff, feed people. We can't do it. We don't have the staff to do it, the resources to do it. They do. We support them because they do the stuff we can't do. Bill Nash takes those 200 kids to Champions Kids Camp. We can't do that. We don't have enough people to be kids counselors and to ride whatever go-karts with all those people and do all that stuff. But they do. We help them do it. When we get together and start to do the ministry God calls us to do, we can change the world. Amen. And I believe we will. Yep. Jesus showed that it didn't matter that Lazarus had been dead four days. He was never worried about it. God showed us through that Ezekiel passage that even out of bones that have completely dried up and become separated, God can do something. Can you imagine that, that vision he had of bones coming together and the clanking and the noise and the skin and the sinew and the flesh? That's the God we came here to worship today. I believe that's the God that will lead us into these communities around us. It'll be a grassroots movement of people that decide this stuff is more important than that stuff. Which train will you be on this week? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as we sing our closing hymn,
just a closer walk with the as you're able would you please stand if today would be the day you unite with our church feel free to come forward as we sing Amen. 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 